Okay. Hi, Kim. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to well, have you here. Thank you for having me. So you've got a book out called Where Yellow Flowers Bloom. And before we get to your book, I always like to just do a little about the author to give people a little idea of who you are and what you've been doing with your life. So if you could give us your backstory first, please, and then we will uh, talk about your book. Sure. So my backstory is um, I was an executive in the medical device industry for about 20 years. Uh, I worked with Johnson & Johnson and other uh, medical device companies, more in the commercial area of marketing and sales. And um, I was happily married to my husband, Dave, and we had two great kids, Jack and Lauren, and a goofy dog. And um, with job relocations, we ended up in Santa Barbara in a town called Montecito. And um, when we moved there, I said, this is my forever home. I love it here. It was, um, you know, people knew your name in town and it was just a um, wonderful place to live. And then in um, 2018, in January, there was torrential rains that followed um, the Thomas fire, which was then the largest wildfire in California history. And all the uh, foliage came off the mountains. And when the heavy rain came, um, <clears throat> part of the mountain bro broke away. And uh, what happened was called the Montecito debris flow and mudslide. And um, the mud roared down with car-sized boulders and down trees, 100-year-old trees, and jammed up in the creeks. And um, 23 people died that night, including my 49-year-old husband and my 17-year-old son and our dog. And uh, our house was totally obliterated, washed away. And um, there was, I think, 63 homes washed away, I think another 400 damaged. It was 30 square miles. Uh, the freeway was closed for 10 days. And um, I was washed away two football fields away and found wrapped in electrical wires, severely injured in an intersection on a debris pile. And my daughter, who was 14, Lauren, was buried alive um, under 20 feet of mud for about six hours under mud, um, a car, part of a roof, an electrical transformer, until her miraculous rescue that was shown around the world. So overnight, um, you know, our life changed dramatically from living the dream in Montecito with a career, with a great family, with being involved in the community and volunteering to half my family's gone. And uh, Lauren and I were injured and we had nothing. The house completely washed away, everything. That's an amazing story. There was no warning that this was coming? <clears throat> they did predict heavy rain, they did. And what they had with the Thomas fire was called an aware and beware. And what it is, is it's an app for your computer or your cell phone. And so they would tell us during the fire when to evacuate. So we'd get it and we'd go evacuate. We did three times. And then when the rain was coming, we weren't in the mandatory evacuation. So we were doing what other people did. We prepped, the, we put up sandbags. We made sure the drains were all clear. Um, but they, um, it was a miscalculation. And, um, and uh, I think most of the people that were killed were in, the, in that, um, you know, didn't have to evacuate um, area because um, the, the, the mountain came down. So it was just a, a tragedy. Do you think that they were more concerned with the fire and then when the rain came, people were sort of happy that the rain was there to try to put out the fire? And they no, the fire was mostly out. I mean, it was, okay. um, they had it under control. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think that. I think um, I, I just don't. People really realize the magnitude of when the mountain has no foliage and there's car-sized boulders sitting precariously on the side of the hill. That when torrential rain came, right, um, it, there was nothing there to hold those things in place, and um, so yeah, it was it was horrendous. How did you manage to survive and your daughter? <laughs> That's a good question. I think I had angels um, helping me um, because if you look at my property, there's probably a thousand boulders on there and some are size of VW vans. Um, <clears throat> and think of all the broken glass from the windows of the houses being destroyed, right? Um, shards passing by and, and live electrical wires. There's no reason why Lauren and I should be alive. Um, it's, it's a true miracle that I ended up on a debris pile at the top, right? So I could breathe. I was trapped in it, but my head was out. 
and that when Lauren was buried alive under 20 feet of mud, that there was a pocket of air about the size of half of volleyball, and it had a little uh, hole the size of a straw going out to the air, that, that that pocket of air didn't land by her kneecap. It didn't land by her belly button. It landed by her mouth and nose so she could survive. And so um, it's just, I think, the grace of God. I, I don't know how we survived it. Were you seriously injured? I mean, was there a long recovery yeah, I was for in you? The hospital. Oh, yeah, I was in the hospital three weeks. I had to learn to walk again. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I was eggplant purple, um, thought I broke my hip. I had a couple surgeries. Um, I had to totally learn how to walk again. That's incredible. So the book, presumably, is this story? It's that and, and a very important other aspect of it. So, you know, our family was, you know, all over the news. Our Christmas card was front page of most major newspapers and on in Time magazine. Um, and but they never really heard the firsthand story of what really happened. You know, actually, they said about me, like, Lauren miraculously survived and so did her mom. They had no idea that how injured I was or that I was on the debris pile and all that stuff. So <clears throat> it's really the firsthand story of who was the family, what happened leading up to it, what happened. And Lauren tells her firsthand account of being buried alive, um, which is pretty intense to read because um, she was buried alive six hours. And um, then I tell my story, what happened, what I remember before I was knocked unconscious when the, when the mud roared in. Um, so it's that, but then it really pivots because of the 23 people who died, Douglas, um, two were considered missing. Um, one was a two-year-old little girl, Lydia, and the other was my son, a 17-year-old. And so um, once I realized that there wasn't much work being done, there had been some initial work really trying to look to find all the victims. But then, um, you know, by Super Bowl Sunday of that year, <clears throat> um, I realized there wasn't much going on in terms of search. And so I was out of the hospital. I was off my walker, off my cane. And I, I kind of mobilized to help lead an effort to find the missing kids, Lydia and Jack. And um, I spent three years um, doing that with a core group of people. And we deployed really fascinating technology from um, anthropology, um, forensic labs, from ground penetrating radar to canine search dogs, the same type of search dogs that looked for Amelia Earhart in the South Pacific recently, or Thomas Jefferson's buried brother in Monticello. Because we, I just had this mama sense that he didn't go to the ocean, he was out there, or he was hauled away. And so um, it really, the book but half of the book is about the journey to find the missing kids and the miraculous twists and turns and astonishing things that happened along the way and then the final outcome. And then it really pivots to what I learned, right? My life was turned upside down. I think I checked all the box of bad things that could happen to someone, right? <clears throat> Half the family killed overnight, house washed away, every single thing I owned washed away, severely injured, it was all bad, bad and bad. And then what did I learn in this, right? What have been the silver linings? What is the growth opportunity? Because um, I want to move forward in life and find joy and meaning, right? Um, I don't want to be in the fetal position on the floor. I want to, I, 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 you know, I want to put meaning to this and, 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 and live a life that can make my husband and son proud and, and with my daughter too. So the book is all that. And people have really said they've, for people who've had grief or tragedy in their life, it's really given them access to it, but it's also given them a lot of hope. It's not a morose book at all. It's really a hopeful book. Um, and that's what I hope it does is help people. One question. You said your daughter was buried under 20 feet of mud. Yes. How did they find her? She screamed. And so she heard some of the um, first responders talking outside. And it was hard to hear because it was a gas leak. But she screamed and screamed and screamed as loud as she her could. And Ben, who was a Montecito fire captain, he says, I think I hear something. And they thought it was coming from a house um, just in the distance. And then Ben said to Andy, he was with Andy, and he says, no, I think it's coming from this pile. But they were incredulous. They're like, how could it come from this pile? There's part of a roof. Like, there should be mud in every crevice. How could someone be under there? But they listened very carefully and she continued to scream at the top of her lungs until it hurt. And they heard her and they said, we hear you. And then it took them two hours to get her out because there was a gas leak. They couldn't use, they couldn't use um, power tools. 
and it was extremely dangerous for them. Actually, Andy, firefighter Andy um, from Montecito, I think he got the Medal, Medal of Valor because he went down into, when they got down enough to get her, they, he went into the hole with her and that was a high risk if another mudslide came through because it was still raining. Um, so it was, I mean, it's all over, it was all over the news. People watched her rescue and just could not believe this 14 year old girl kind of, and she kind of walked away with it. They said, can we carry you to the ambulance? And Lauren says, no, I'm walking. Wow. Yeah. It was a wow. She's the strongest girl I know. Huh. What does she do now? She is a student in, at Stanford university. Fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Did they ever find your husband and your son? Did they ever find the body? Yeah, so Dave was found quite quickly. Um, he was found a mile and a half on the, uh, the surf line of the beach. Um, so I, I learned about that pretty quickly, and the dog was found. Jack, you know, was one of the missing, and um, it was in May of 2021 through the help of um, the U UC Santa Barbara Anthropology Department and specifically an ar a bioarchaeologist archaeologist Dr. Danielle Curran, a professor, she and her team of some volunteer students came out to look for about um, two years and they, they deployed a lot of technology and uh, it was in May of 2021 uh, they found bone and um, so um, we didn't find all of them uh, but after almost three years of looking I was just grateful for something that I could have buried um, to give me some closure and uh, his bones were found in um, in our carpet um, with some of his underwear and tile from the from the, the sh his shower. And so they did all the you know all that. And so it, for me, it just gave me some some closure, um, you know, to to lay him next to his dad at the cemetery. Yeah. So what are you doing now, aside from writing oh, well, this book? I'm writing a book. <laughs> I wrote a book. I mean, I never thought I would write a book, but I did, and it was. Um, really beneficial, I think, for me. Um, I'm retired, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, I couldn't go back to corporate America. I always had to stabilize for my daughter. There was so much to do. I mean, I had nothing. I had to get a new passport, new driver's license, new toilet bowl plunger, new couch, new mattress, everything, right? Um, and so I'm retired from the corporate world. Um, now I speak, I do speaking engagements and um, I wrote the book. And, and my real goal is that that book really can help other people. That's it certainly helped me. I think it helped me go from desperate grief to more peaceful integration or adaptation of what my life is now. Um, but I really, and, and that's the nicest feedback I've gotten is people said that um, it moved them a lot and inspired them. And so if it, if it can help even one or two people, then, then it's worth it, right? Absolutely. Kim, we have to wind this down. We are out of time. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your incredible story. Oh, thanks. Uh, the, book, the book is called Where Yellow Flowers Bloom. The author is Kim Canton. Uh, it, it is available now, right? Yes, on Amazon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Last question. Do you have a website you want to give out? Sure. It's, it's my name. It's kimcanton.com and Canton is T-I-N, like a tin can, kimcanton.com. Um, yeah, and they can see everything there too. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you for coming on the show and best of luck with the book and, and your oh, other Oh, thank work. you.